So I kind of finished the book of Matthew last week, and I was talking to Phil this week, and he said, oh, come on, you got one or two more in you. So. <laughs> Today's an addendum, we'll call it that. How's that? Read a, somebody had posted a quote of uh, C.S. Lewis yesterday that really grabbed my attention. I'm just going to sum it up with this where he said one of our missions and main goals is to teach truth. And he went on to a dissertation about that and came back to it again of that's our goal is to teach truth. And it hit me and I got to thinking about, especially when we're studying the scriptures and people are like, what about this or what about that? And it's like, those are all great things to discuss, but sometimes they detract from the reality, this is truth. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit today as we uh, work through our notes here. I'm going to start page one of the notes, Acts chapter one, because in verse one says, the former account I made, O Theophilus, sorry, I'm going to turn the light on here. There we go. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up. After he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his sufferings by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during forty days and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. It caught my attention that over and over and over when you read the Gospels, Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of heaven is like. But... Even we, with all of the scripture, often wrestle with what in the world did he mean? And we know that the disciples struggled when Jesus said things. And after the resurrection, we read a couple places where now they understood what he meant. And in another place, it talks about that Jesus opened their understanding. So imagine after the resurrection and being with the raised Jesus, who you watch die and put in a grave, now begins to talk to you about the kingdom of God and how things might become a little bit more clear as to who he really is. The kingdom of God, as we've used in times past recently as well, I just want to cover some information regarding what that idea means relative to Jesus. Daniel chapter 7, Daniel has all of these visions, a lot of them apply to his day with the way the world is going to be changing, but also applies, as we know, to the end times and revelation. And in the midst of one of those, Daniel is watching, he says, I was watching night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming, with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. Now again, in Daniel's day, Daniel is in Babylon, Babylon then is conquered by the Medes and then the Persians. Then we have Rome and the Greeks come on the scene. There's been kingdoms, the Assyrians prior to that, the Egyptians. They have watched and known historically that kingdoms have come and kingdoms have gone. But Daniel talks about a kingdom who has a king that's eternal. A kingdom that doesn't go away, a kingdom that isn't overtaken, one that isn't destroyed. And we know that he's referencing the kingdom of God. So Jesus is talking to his disciples about the kingdom of God. I am the king. Philippians, a very well-known verse to us. Philippians 2, verse 9, Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven, those of the earth, and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. 
John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And then the connecting verse to the light of men is 1 Peter. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy. So for 40 days, Jesus talks to his disciples about their mission, but also about the kingdom of God. And again, just connecting it to this, truth. There is a kingdom that's eternal. There is a kingdom that's everlasting. There is a kingdom who has a king who will never be taken off his throne. Truth. Regardless of things we don't understand and things that we may debate about timing, blah, 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 all those different things, there is a truth. There is a kingdom that has a king. And the king on that throne is Jesus. Now, I want to take a look at some historical things to get where we're going to end today. Bottom of page one of the notes, Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. In the discussion with Moses at the burning bush, Moses says, God, who do I tell the people sent me? And God says, I am that I am. If you watch the movies, there's always that reverb there. I am that I am. We've looked at this before, but again, it's important to go back and look at it. That phrase, I am that I am, in the Hebrew, the meaning of it comes to be the one who exists, the one who causes things to become, the self-existent one. In other words, in that little phrase, God is saying, I'm the one who always has been, and I am the one who causes things to come into existence. That phrase, that name, for the Hebrew, their, their name is Jehovah. So the substitution of I am that I am is Jehovah. And in our scriptures, when they translated them over for you and I, if you read in the front of the Bible, you will often find them telling you what they've done. They have taken the Jewish name Jehovah, and they have changed it into either God in all capital letters or Lord in all capital letters. So when you're reading through the Old Testament in particular, when you see Lord in all caps or God in all caps, understand what they're talking about. They're talking about the self-existent one who causes things. And again, another connection to that is to breathe. So God breathes and things come into existence. Again, what, what is speaking other than breath? So God spoke and there was light. And God spoke and there was creation. And God spoke and the planets were put in place. God spoke and the sun and the moon and the stars. God spoke and creatures we're on the earth. God spoke, and I am that I am. That's who that is. Now, we jump ahead in history, page two of the notes. <clears throat> Exodus 33, again, a very familiar conversation, but we're going somewhere with this. Exodus 33, verse 9. And it came to pass, when Moses entered the tabernacle that the pillar of cloud descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle, and the Lord talked with Moses. Again, if you look closely, Lord is in all caps. In other words, it's saying Jehovah spoke with Moses, or I am that I am spoke with Moses. And all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the tabernacle door, and all the people rose and worshipped each man in his tent door. So when the Lord spoke to Moses face to face, as a man speaks to his friend, and he would return to the camp, but his servant Joshua, 
the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. Now, prior to the tabernacle, there was the tent of meeting. The same thing happened, and sometimes that's what's substituted in here. There was a place where Moses would go out of the camp and enter into a, a tent, and God would come and talk to Moses in there, and Joshua stood at the door. Now, I think one of Joshua's roles was to make sure that no one went in there. Only Moses could go in. But understand, you're not talking about a huge structure. You're talking about a tent. And Joshua is standing at the door. And there's a conversation happening inside the tent. 99.999999% of the chance Joshua heard the conversation. Moses would get from God what God wanted to say to him. Moses would go into the camp and tell the people. But Joshua stayed at the place of meeting. So God talked to Moses face to face. We know that's very important because very few people had that opportunity. But let me ask you a question. How did Jesus talk to his disciples? face to face. They looked at each other. And I will submit to you, and we're going to get to it again, that the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives is they have that same kind of intimacy. To talk, in essence, face to face, spirit to spirit. One of the conversations that occurs at the tent of meeting is listed next then, Exodus 33, verse 12. Then Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way, that I may know you, and that I may find grace in your sight and consider that this nation is your people and he said my presence will go with you and I will give you rest now notice one of the first things Moses asks show me your way that I may find favor in your sight Show me your way. Notice what he doesn't say. God, give me the list of do's and don'ts. He says, show me your way. Show me how you walk and where you walk. God, I want to see your footprints so that I can walk where you're walking. You understand what Moses is actually saying is, I want to walk with you. This is very, very important because, again, the whole idea of law permeates the church, it permeates our society, and it trips us up. Moses is saying to God, let me see where you're going so that I can walk with you. Because I understand that walking with you, remember what got them to this point. They have followed God cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. And when they didn't walk with God, things went poorly. So Moses is saying, I want to walk with you. Let me see where you're going. And God says, my presence will go with you, and I'll give you rest. Now, again, I find that very interesting because why does God say that to Moses there? Well, why does Moses want to know where God is going? Because if you don't know where God is going, what happens to your inner spirit? What happens when we don't know where things are headed? 
We see a circumstance, but we don't know what the next moment holds. We tend to get anxious. And we're not at peace. The mind can't settle because I don't know what's coming next. So God says, here's the deal, Moses. I understand you're anxious about this. I will go with you. You'll know exactly where I'm going. You, you want to walk with me? We'll walk together. And because I'll show you where I'm walking, rest will come. I'll give you rest. Verse 15, then he said to him, Moses talking to God, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here, for how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight, except you go with us? So we shall be separate, your people and I, from all the people who are on the face of the earth. So the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you have spoken. For you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. See, Moses keeps reiterating, I want to walk with you, God. Wherever you go, that's where I want to, that's where I want to be. And God says, no problem. No problem. Moses says, please show me your glory. God, I want to know you as you know me. We have these conversations face to face, but God, there's still so much about you that I'm not privy to. Verse 19, then he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and I'll proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face for no man can see my face and live. And the Lord said, here is a place by me and you shall stand on the rock. So it shall be while my glory passes by that I will put you in the cleft of the rock. I'll cover you with my hand while I pass by. And then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. And the Lord said to Moses, cut two tablets of stone like the first ones. And I'll write on these tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. God says, I came to have a relationship with you. I came to marry you. And the tablets are the covenant of that marriage relationship. And you broke them. But your heart's desire is you want to be with me. You are acting like a wife who wants to be with her husband. And I'll honor that because I see what your heart... Understand, folks, it's the heart. Moses' heart is to walk with God. And his heart is, is that the people he's leading will walk with God. And God says, I hear the heart. So cut out two more stones, bring them with you up to the mountaintop. And you'll get, experience a relationship with me, not in its fullness, but it's going to be more intimate than you know me now. Verse 2, Exodus 34. So be ready in the morning and come up in the mountain to Mount Sinai and present yourself to me there on the top of the mountain. And no man shall come up with you. Let no man be seen throughout all the mountains. Let neither flocks nor herds feed before the mountain. So he cut two tablets of stone like the first ones. Then Moses rose early in the morning and went up to Mount Sinai. And the Lord had commanded, as the Lord had commanded him. And he took in his hand the two tablets of stone. Now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there. And proclaimed the name of the Lord, and the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children, to the third and fourth generation. Now let me just stop there for a second, because here's what law has done to us. Because law is so prevalent in ruling our lives, 
we will read that passage, but out of everything that's been stated, the part that we remember is, I won't forgive iniquity. That's the part we take notice of. Because law teaches us that's who God is. But understand, that's not who God is. I am that I am, Jehovah, Lord in all capitals, is merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and children's children. What's he saying? Well, let's deal with the first part, because again, we're talking about truth here. He is merciful. He is long-suffering. He's forgiving. He wants to restore. He wants to redeem. That's God's passion. Well, who then are the guilty? Well, consider who he is to begin with. He wants to forgive. He wants to show mercy. And again, let's throw in here, he's long-suffering. God is patient. Why, what is he patient about? He is patient, waiting for people to turn and walk with him. He wants to show mercy. He wants to forgive sin. That's who he is. But in the reality, part of everything, if people refuse his mercy, if they refuse his forgiveness, if they say in their heart, I don't want to walk with you, there is judgment. But God doesn't sit up there saying, oh, I hope they don't turn. I hope that I want to smoke that guy. I hope he doesn't turn. That's not who God is. God does everything to implore the heart to turn and come to him and walk in relationship. And he's willing to forgive anything in order to have that relationship, to have that restoration. And he'll wait, and he'll wait, and he'll wait. And praise God, he does. I resisted him for three years, I resisted him. And when I finally yielded, his love was there. He wasn't looking at his watch saying, you got two more seconds, Tim, and then it's over. <laughs> Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, his spirit came and grabbed my heart and said, would you yield to him? And the reason I wouldn't is because I thought I was going to be looked down on and criticized and disdained. And I will never forget. I had determined I was going to yield to him that coming Sunday and I sat in the service just waiting for the moment and as soon as I stepped in that aisle there was a love that descended upon that place where God said do you understand you believe in a lie because I want you God is long suffering this is truth people we will encounter people who don't think that's who God is. They think he's a mean ogre. They think he just wants to crush people. They think he's keeping tally to see, okay, well, you, you know, you've sinned one too many times. It's all over. That's not who God is. Verse 8, so Moses made haste and bowed his head towards the earth and worshiped. Then he said, if now I found grace in your sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray, go among us, even though we're a stiff-necked people. 
and pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us as your inheritance. Do you understand Moses got it? Moses said, I know who I am and I know who these people are. We are sinners. We are stiff-necked. We won't, we won't yield to the righteousness. But God, based on who you just told me you are, here's my cry. Forgive me and forgive them and come and walk among us. And God says, behold, I make a covenant. Again, it becomes an old word to us. But God says, I'll make a marriage contract with you. Before all your people, I will do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation. And all the people among whom you are shall see the work of the Lord. For it is an awesome thing that I will do with you. Observe what I command you this day. Behold, I'm driving out from before you the Amorite, the Canaanite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Take heed to yourself, lest you make a commandment with the inhabitants of the land where you're going, lest it be a snare in your midst. Now, again, let's not lose track of what's happening here. This conversation starts with Moses' heart to walk with God. And God says, I will make a covenant with you, with your people. We will enter into a relationship. And observe what I command you. Now, again, law wants to hear that. Okay, God's going to give us things. That... Don't forget the first part. Moses says, show me your way. I want to walk with you. I want to go where you go. I want, to, I want to do what you're doing. So when God gives commandments, understand it's them doing it together. He doesn't say, Moses, go do that. It's, we're going over here today. And you show your true love for me by walking with me to go do that. And then God makes a stipulation. He says, don't make covenants with the people of the land. Well, why? Because, again, a covenant is like a marriage contract. And he's saying, those people who are currently in the land don't want to walk with me. So don't engage in a relationship with them to follow them because they'll take you away from me. So God covenants, I will go with you. I will protect you. I will bless you with all that you need. I will give you victory over wickedness and give you the land of promise. I will prosper you in so that you can multiply in the land with righteous offspring. That's God's covenant summed up. Man's part, Moses' part, Israel's part, our part, is to love the Lord our God with all, his, with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength. And to teach our children to do the same thing. To walk with God. And to teach our children, walk with God. Beginning with the exodus from Egypt, and you could start before that, but beginning with the exodus from Egypt, God proved himself faithful to his word. God says, this is what I'll be to you. And from Egypt on, God was those things. When they needed water, God made water come from a rock. They needed food, God supplied the food in a number of different ways. They needed victory over the Amalekites, God gave them victory over the Amalekites. God did what he had promised to do. His word was faithful. Joshua chapter 1, page uh, 3 of the notes. Verse 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun. Again, notice, the word Lord is in all caps. I am that I am, the self-existent one, 
the one who causes things to come into being, the one who speaks, and whatever I speak happens, had spoken with Moses, but Moses is now dead. But the kid who used to stand at the door of the tent of meeting while the conversation was happening in there, that same Lord now comes and talks to him and says, the guy you served is gone. You're now in charge. So I'm talking to you. Verse 2, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Now again, listen to what's happening here. It sounds like God is saying, here's, here's your task. Joshua, get the people, go over there. You can get the idea that God is simply sitting in a stationary place and saying, you guys need to move from there to there. But that's not what's happening. Because remember, now they have the tabernacle, they have the Ark of the Covenant, and whenever they move, God moves by the cloud by day, pillar of fire by night, and then the first thing that moves out of the camp is the Ark of the Covenant on the shoulders of the priests. And wherever that goes, everybody follows. So when God says, take the people and cross over and go take the land, he's not saying, I'm going to sit here while you guys do that. He's saying the same thing he did say to Moses, and that is, that's where I'm going. Walk with me there. My covenant's still operating. Every place of the sole of your foot will tread upon I have given you, as I said to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon as far as the great river of the Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and the great sea towards going down to the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. So God just affirms to Joshua that relationship that Moses and I had, I'm now giving to you. That then drives that the whole rest of the conversation. Be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide an inheritance the land I swore to the fathers to give them. The land that I swore, the land that I spoke to give to their fathers. Who spoke it? I am that I am. The one who speaks things into existence. The one who has been faithful to fulfill Everything he has said. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do all according to the law which my Moses servant commanded you. Oh, now we're getting back to the text. Here are the do's and don'ts. Do not throw out everything that's in this and just think law. It's not about law. It's about walking with God. And part of walking with God is to understand who he is. That's why we have the law. The law tells me about who God is. Hey, if your neighbor's cattle comes over onto your property, take it home. But if he lives way over there, Put it in your barn, feed it, water it, and then tomorrow take it home. That sounds like love and mercy to me. And if his cattle keep coming over and I keep taking them home, that sounds like long-suffering, and it sounds like forgiveness. You understand, in the law is the very character of God. 
Now we know what happened. Because we want to try to prove ourselves to God, Paul says the flesh took the law and said, okay, I'm going to do that without you. And that's when the law becomes a problem. When I simply try to accomplish the list without walking with God. That's the problem. But the law is not a problem. And if we go to it through the desire to walk with God and understand his ways, it becomes an instruction to us. It doesn't have to delineate every encounter I'm going to have but it gives me snippets of how to love and treat people with mercy and grace and patience and forgiveness so that I can walk in the character of who God is. So God keeps saying to Joshua, as I was with Moses, I'll be with you. We're going to walk together and accomplish this. Everybody okay? Page four of the notes. Now, one of the things we must understand is what God says to Joshua and what he had said to Moses from God's point of view. Not from our point of view, from God's point of view. When God says, I will be with you, what does that mean from his point of view? The scriptures tells us that God hates divorce. And again, we just bring it down into marriage relationships in the earth. But what is God really talking about? Because in the Old Testament, God takes issue and gets angry with the Israelites because they keep walking away from him. And he calls them idolaters and adulterers. From God's point of view, God says, I have entered into a marriage relationship with you and I will never violate it. God says, I will never turn my back on you and walk away. You say, but wait a minute. No, he did. No, no, no. When the scriptures tell us that God wrote the certificate of divorce to Israel, it is because Israel said, we don't want you. We want to be over here. We want to walk with these people. We want to walk with that God. And when it reached a certain point, God said, fine, if you don't want me, go. But understand, that is the people divorcing God, not God divorcing the people. So when the scripture says God hates divorce, understand that's his point of view. And it's his point of view is because he'll never do it. Where did it all start? In the garden. Adam and Eve walked with God. God walked with them. The serpent comes along and says, hey, by the way, come over here and not walk with him. And Adam and Eve listened to the serpent and followed his voice, in essence, divorcing God. That's where it all started. So we don't accuse God of divorcing us. The truth is, it is we who have divorced him. But God is faithful to his word. He is faithful to his promises. He's faithful to his covenant. That's why Paul writes in 2 Corinthians. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, Silvanus and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him was yes. For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him amen to the glory of God through us. Paul is saying, look, when God made promises, he will not violate them. We may choose not to walk in them, but God will never be unfaithful to his word. He will always honor 
what he has said. Now, we jump from Moses and Joshua watching God's faithfulness over a couple thousand years. And God was faithful to everything he said, which includes the blessings and the curses. God says, if you walk away from me, you're going to suffer for that. Well, guess what? When they walked away from him, they suffered from him. God was faithful to everything he said. But he always, even when they walked away, there was always the provision, when you turn, I'll bring you back. Why? Because God is merciful, long-suffering, ready to forgive. He wants us to walk with him. To continue that legacy of faithfulness, God sends Jesus into the earth to fulfill the greatest promise. The loosing of us from the kingdom of darkness and restore us into his kingdom of light. And to send a promise of his Holy Spirit to revive my spirit take up residence within so that I can have personal, intimate conversation with him. That's what Jesus came to do. When Jesus walked the earth, he proved that he was the son of God by living a life that put on display the character of God. Merciful, forgiving, spoke things into being. You're healed. <laughs> he didn't even have to be there. Go your way. The person you wanted me to heal, they're healed. He put on display the very character of God, proving he is in fact God in the flesh. And he fulfilled what he said he would do. Jesus is the word and the power and authority to accomplish that word. So in Matthew 28, having risen from the dead, and at one point joins his disciples at the Sea of Galilee, We read the tail end of the book of Matthew, Matthew 28, verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Again, we talked about this last week. That statement alone, connected with everything else, is saying, I am the eternal king who rules an everlasting kingdom. And my reign is over every other name. In all peoples, all tongues, all nations, all tribes are under me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Now again, he is God in the flesh, Right? So when he says, go and make disciples of all nations, is he standing there saying, you go over there, but I'm staying here? No. Because of the gift of the Holy Spirit, when he says, go, he says, what? And lo, I'm up with you always. I am that I am, the one who speaks things into being, Lord Jehovah, the one who fulfills and accomplishes all of his word because he has the power and authority and the faithfulness to do it, says to his disciples, I am with you always. You could take that and say, as I was with Moses, as I was with Joshua, as I was with David, 
as I was with Samuel, as I was with Elijah, as I was with Elisha, as I was with all these other guys. I'm still the same person, and I will be with you. Wherever I lead you. You say, but he said to them, go. <laughs> Paul writes to the church at Rome and says, those who are led by the spirits, by the spirit, are the sons of Abraham. The promise of the Spirit is to be the replacement of Jesus. Again, God spoke to Moses face to face. God spoke to Joshua. God spoke to lots of other people. Jesus spoke to his disciples. And the gift of the Holy Spirit is that replacement of Jesus and the Father to be in our lives, to speak to us individually, personally, about where I am, what I'm doing, what it is that he's doing and wants me to participate in, where to go, what to say, what to do. He wants to be that voice to me. He's called the Counselor. He's called the Comforter. He's called lots of different names. But understand, He's not our assistant. He is the husband part of a relationship with us. Where He's the husband and I'm the wife. And I walk with Him. And the issue becomes for us, just as it was for Moses, just as it was for Joshua, just as it was for all, everyone, and that is, is my heart's desire to walk where he walks? Have I been like Moses where I say, show me your way, because I want to be wherever you are? Again, we, I frustrate at the damage that law has done. Because Jesus says to his disciples, if you love me, obey my commandments. And we think, okay, well, what are they? Give me the list, and I'll prove to you I'll love you. But in saying that, he's saying the same thing that God had said to Moses. If you love me, walk with me. And as you walk with me, I'll tell you what we're going to do. Because we're the visible, tangible representation of his voice in the earth. So the Spirit speaks to us and says, pray for that person. And in obedience to what the Spirit's saying, I pray. And I'm displaying my love to my husband. We got all tangled up in this mess. So we have a kingdom that's eternal with an everlasting king who is faithful to everything he says and promises to be with us if we will walk with him. So the writer of Hebrews says, we have this anchor of the soul. We have this hope as an anchor to the soul. What's he mean when he says an anchor to the soul? Rest. What did God say to Moses? I'll walk with you and I'll give you rest. Because if God, the one that I am that I am, who speaks things into being and has given him all these promises, is walking with you, what is there to be afraid of? What is there to be moved by? Because he's there with the power and authority to accomplish. And he reigns above every other authority. He is supreme.
I've shared before on a much, much, much smaller scale. One of my good friends in high school was Oscar. Big O, everybody called him. Oscar was 6'5", 325 pounds. Farm boy. I, I wish I had cut it out. And to this day, it drives me crazy that I didn't. He was at the state fair, and he had a hog under this arm and a hog under this arm walking around with him. What a favorite picture. To this day, it's like, why didn't you cut that out? Oscar was my friend. I was afraid of no one. <laughs> I'll never forget, in, in history class, in world history class, Oscar sat in front of me, and then in front of him was this little guy who was always just mouthy. And he would never shut up in class. So one day, he was sitting there just... Blah, 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 blah. And the teacher looked at Oscar and said, Oscar, fix him. Oscar grabs him by the shoulders. Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> you can't do that today. Good old days. But we read the Great Commission. We know it by heart. And we just read it. There it is. But understand, when Jesus says, I am with you always, what's contained in that statement? The I am that is I am. The one who has such power and authority that all he has to do is speak and it happens. Is our husband. So wherever he walks and we follow, there's nothing to fear. And then we need to learn from the early church. Because the early church was threatened. Stop preaching that guy's name. And they were beaten and then told again, stop it. And they went back and they met with the other believers and they said, hey, here's what happened. And then they prayed. And they said, God, fill us with the spirit and give us boldness. They looked at fear and they said, you know what? We have an authority. I have a husband. I have a king. And fear bows down to him. And fear wants to rule my life. It wants to consume me. It wants to bring in unrest to my inner being. So I'm turning to my husband. And I'm saying, give me the spirit. Fill me with your presence. And God answered that prayer. The place shook. And they were filled with the Spirit, and they preached the Word of God with boldness. You don't need to bow down to fear. You say, but things are happening. Yes, God knows that. And the God who is the Alpha and the Omega has already been in the moment in which we don't understand because it hasn't happened yet for us. He's already been in the moment we're standing in now. He's already in our tomorrow. He's in, already in our next year. He's already been there. He knows what's coming. And if we will simply find our rest in walking with him, he will accomplish what needs to be done in the moment because he knows what the righteous thing is. Whether or not it makes sense to me, whether or not I like it, the issue is, is my heart in love with my husband and will I walk with him and trust him with whatever the outcome is? Because it's that trust in him that lets my heart find peace. It's what brings my mind to restfulness.
So Jesus wasn't just giving them a mission. He was including the promise, we do this together, guys, just like we did before. It's just going to be a little bit different. You won't see me physically, but the Spirit's going to lead you. His presence, his authority, his position, his faithfulness is the hope that's the anchor of our soul. Amen? You stand with me this morning. Almighty God, we do praise you for your word that gives us truth. And Father, I pray, move it into us and let it deal surgically with the things that have held us in bondage. Lies that have let fear dictate and at times consume and drive it out. Remove, Lord God, all aspects of darkness with the light of your spirit that we can walk in your peace and walk in faithfulness to you. Thank you, Father, for words of assurance, comfort, strength. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.